So the talk, uh, there's, unfortunately, there's going to be overlap between talks because we are talking about a few micron layer thickness uh, in the eye, you know, so there's going to be overlap of the talks. So I hope you will excuse for that. This is just the beginning uh, slide, which is similar to what Dr. Mahesh has shown. I'm not going to go over this, nor about this concept of anomalous PVD, which has been very well uh, illustrated by Dr. Mahesh's talk. So epidermal membrane could be idiopathic or could be secondary. Secondary it could be due to various vasculopathies, intraocular inflammation, injuries, retinal breaks and detachments, dystrophies, and iatrogenic post surgically as well as following retinopexy. Now each one of these are important when you see what they have a repercussion over the visual recovery and the ease with which you can remove the membrane. We can go back to the Donald Gas, who has classified everything related to macula, as macula hole or a, a parietal membrane. He classified them as grade zero when it's something you see like a fine glistening membrane. We don't actually see it as a membrane, but as a glistening reflex in the macular area, something which has been called a cellophane maculopathy. There is no retinal distortion and patients are mostly asymptomatic. You pick it up on routine clinical examination. Grade one is where there's some inner retinal wrinkling and can cause metamorphosis if there's fovea involved. But if it's extra foveal, it may be totally asymptomatic again. And grade 2 is where the membrane has opacity. You can actually visibly see that there's something lining the retinal surface and there's a full thickness retinal distortion. And this can be associated sometimes with nerve fiber layer infarcts and even microneurisms uh, and hemorrhages. So please remember that apiratal membranes can be associated with uh, microneurisms. That doesn't mean that the patient has some other vascular, vascular retinopathy. And 80% of these are symptomatic. Now, what is the relationship between the vitreous and the epiratal membrane? A posterior vitreous detachment is seen in almost 60 to 90 percent of these cases. And partial PVD with epiratal membrane with a vitreomacular traction is what is more symptomatic, causes more structural damage than a full PVD with a epiratal membrane. In a full PVD, what is happening is basically there is a, a vitreoscisis occurring. A thin layer of vitreous is getting stuck to the retina, but the whole rest of it is detached with the body of the vitreous and hence there is no pull on the retina but there is the skytic vitreous stuck to the retina gets convert, converted into fibrosis causing the apparatal membrane. But where there is a partial PVD with VMT there is more likelihood of cystoid changes in the retina, worse vision at presentation because of the cystoid changes and sometimes you will be surprised patients keep postponing surgery, a late onset PVD can detach the apparatal membrane and they can be cured of all symptoms. But the problem is, we don't know exactly which came first, which came later. Did the PVD cause the ERM because of skysis or the, did the ERM occur before the onset of PVD? There is one particular study by Foos, a histopathological study, where he has shown vitreous gel between the internal limiting membrane and the epiratal membrane, considering that possibly the ERM has grown even before the vitreous separated. So there is a controversy in that understanding. When we evaluate these patients, we evaluate them both clinically and on OCT. Clinical evaluation is equally important because OCT you are concentrating just on the central part and more of an anatomical relationship of the membrane vis-a-vis -vis the retina and the RPE. But we are also interested in knowing what caused the epiratal membrane because that has a reflection on the visual recovery. So we look for evidence of branch retinal vein occlusions, but very often tributary vein occlusions can be missed because there are very tiny vessels and the sheathed vessel can be camouflaged by a parietal membrane. A previous coriolitical scar very close to the fovea again can be obscured by the thick membrane unless you are already aware of the patient's previous history. And a visual equity should be explainable by the grade of membrane that you see. If you see a very fine cellophane membrane, the vision is 6 by 36, obviously that is not the cause of the vision loss. On OCT, you have two ways of understanding the OCT evaluation. One is to understand the anatomy and the effect of the apparatal membrane on the distortion of the normal anatomy and visual function. And the second is for planning surgery. The apparatal membrane is seen as a hyperreflective layer. Obviously, we understand that OCT, like ultrasound, is an interpretation of the reflection of the light. And hence, the interpretation has to be uh, tempered with the knowledge that there are other hyperreflective layers within the retina or layers which could become hyperreflective because of time. So, a periodic membrane is a hyperreflective layer. 
you can have blunting of the foveal contour you can have variable retinal wrinkling and a variable increase in the retinal thickness and intraretinal cysts or fluid collection and there can be variable retino membrane adhesion this is just to show highlight the fact that uh, that these four layers are more important than the inner layers in the causation of visual symptoms but what we are concentrating on in OCT with the epithelial membrane is the relationship of these inner layers but the studies have shown in the swept source OCT and and the uh, adaptive optics OCT that it is the micro folds at this level which cause the metamorphopsia not the inner retinal wrinkling and as those micro folds we may not be able to detect on SD OCT or even a swept source OCT what you require is adaptive optics OCT for that so the foveal contour can be hidden under a thick membrane and sometimes a good vision can be actually explained by the fact that under the relatively thick membrane the fovea actually is quite healthy a spontaneously peeled membrane reveals the true nature of the fovea is evident only on the OCT sometimes on top of it there is a opalescent membrane which doesn't tell you what is the fovea like a blunting of the fovea alone can be confused with uh, cystoid macular edema uh, especially when the membrane is very very fine and a little away from the center of the fovea a widened foveal contour is what sometimes is labeled as a pseudo hole and this is a typical example of a membrane which is relatively thick so on clinical examination on biomicroscopy you may not be exactly aware of what is a foveal contour like but this patient may be actually having good vision uh, because of the good foveal contour